Welcome back to the Invasive Brews channel, everybody. And if, unless you've been hiding under a rock or maybe you've been binge watching the new Obi-Wan series, then you probably heard the announcement or the news article or on the news that the Conservancy of Southwest Florida just bagged a record sized Burmese python. An 18 foot, 215 pound behemoth of an animal. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she put up a good fight, but. Um, we were able to restrain her and then, you know, take her out of the woods so she couldn't consume any more native wildlife. Now, I did get to go down to Southwest Florida just recently, a couple weeks ago, to study and document several of different invasive species, and Burmese python was one of those species that I got to handle. Nothing quite this large. The ones that I caught were about eight feet, seven feet, um, but I am very jealous of this research team who got to handle this animal. Now I wanted to take this opportunity to give you a few quick facts about the Burmese python and while I do, I'm going to enjoy my last beer from that said trip from Funky Buddha Brewing. This is the Floridian Wheat. They are out of Oakland Park, yeah, Oakland Park, Florida, uh, down by Fort Lauderdale and I'm going to be drinking it out of my invasive species brewing glass from Fort Lauderdale. I just really loved this glass and their logo. So if you haven't been down there already, they have several good breweries and I highly recommend Funky Buddha and especially Invasive Species Brewing. Okay, so let's get in to the Burmese Python. That's pretty good. These snakes are non-venomous snakes, meaning that they don't have fangs, but they do have about a hundred backwards facing teeth within their skull. And since they are non-venomous, that just means that they are constrictors. And constrictors constrict their prey. They squeeze them to death. And every time the animal exhales a little bit, the snake squeezes a little tighter. And it prevents any more oxygen or expansion of the lungs. And pretty soon that prey item is asphyxiated. Now these snakes, just like many other snakes, can take down prey items that are much larger than they are. It is a myth, however, that they can unhinge their jaw in order to do that. Instead, they have multiple joints within their jawbone, and unlike us mammals, we have a single lower jawbone called the mandible. But snakes, they have two. They, it is separated right here, and right here, between the two mandibles, they have a stretchable ligament that ex allows expansion to go around those prey items. And you've all seen videos of snakes eating eggs. Well, that's because of those joints and that stretchable ligament. These snakes will prey upon basically anything. They have found 24 different species of mammals within their stomachs, 47 species of birds, and two species of reptiles, including wood storks, pied-bellied uh, grebes, rats, rabbits, mice, opossums, raccoons. They've even found claws of a full-grown bobcat. The one that they just caught down in Southwest Florida, the 18-footer, had uh, hoof cores from a full-sized white-tailed deer. Now when these snakes nest, they will take over old armadillo and gopher tortoise and fox dens in order to get down in underground and nest. These also act as kind of a refuge from cold snaps in the weather. They can escape that cold weather. Each, each female is capable of laying you know, anywhere from 40 to 100 eggs with the average uh, being around 43, I believe is what I heard. And the one that they just caught, the 18 footer, had 122 eggs in it. And they breed about once every other year, but something that big is probably around 15 to 20 years old. So every other year that she's been breeding, and now that she can reproduce up to 122 eggs, that's kind of showing you the, the magnitude of this species. And when they hatch, they're actually just as large or larger than a lot of the native uh, snakes down there. So they already have a size advantage at the time. The female will guard the nest up until they do hatch. And once they hatch, these little babies are out on their own. That guarding of the nest that's giving this uh, species an edge because a lot of reptiles don't guard their nests. Instead, predators can easily snack on these eggs. But if there's a big mother python guarding the nest, it's likely nothing's going to bother it. Now there is a video that just surfaced this past few months of a bobcat actually raiding a, nest, a python nest with the mother on it. So 
that is kind of good news for the native wildlife that they are kind of utilizing this as a resource. Now these, these snakes are native to Southeast Asia, you know, India, South China, and Vietnam is where they're native to. And in their native range, they're actually vulnerable. They are on the IUCN, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, as vulnerable, which means their, their populations are not stable. They are kind of decrease or declining because humans are hunting them, they're utilizing them as a meat source, they're utilizing the skins as you know leather and clothes and uh, belts, boots, stuff like that. So there is a value on them over in their, their native range and their populations are declining. <laughs> So if anyone were to ask how these snakes got here, well, it's through the pet trade. These are a very popular pet, and in the, here in the U.S., you know, back in the 70s and 60s, reptiles were all the craze. Look at the, you know, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. They kind of made a, a big increase on red-eared sliders and other turtle species. Well, snakes are a very popular pet. Now, if someone were to ask, is it an intentionally released species? Was it, were they escaped pets or is it because of Hurricane Andrew in 1992 that destroyed a breeding facility? Well, the answer is yes to all of those. I mean, a lot of people like to blame pet owners, but a lot of pet owners are responsible. So it's just the few that are releasing a pet out in the wild or maybe one gets out of its enclosure and goes out into the wild. But if you think about it, a released pet has a very low probability of survival. Um, there's diseases, there's, he's been coddled all his life, he's been fed out of a hand, now he's gotta hunt? Well, he might have a tough go at it. Like I said in 1992, Hurricane Andrew hit and it wiped out a couple of breeding facilities and hundreds if not thousands of these snakes got emptied into the ecosystem all at once. Now their survivability rate is a lot higher because they're, they're, they were released locally in a group which it'll be easier to find a mate, and that's how that population kind of went about. Now, I do not condone absolutely, absolutely not release any pet into the wild, whether it's your goldfish, whether it's, you know, a feral cat, whether it's a snake, whether it's a chameleon, nothing. Do not release anything out in the wild if you're just tired of taking care of it. It's gonna be bad for the pet, and it's gonna be bad for nature. The Everglades are starting to fight back against this invasive species. Balance always finds a way in nature, but at the expense of some native species, most likely, will go extinct. That's the sad part about invasive species. A lot of these species are here to stay because there is just no getting rid of them. Think about the lake trout in Yellowstone, the silver carp in the Illinois River, and now the pythons in the Everglades. But they're here to stay. And if we can get them in a controllable population, that might be a chance for nature to actually take its course and find that balance. In their native range, they have large predators. I mean, there, there's tigers that are native there that's gonna take out a big snake. Their main predator in their native range is the king cobra. The king cobra is a voracious snake eater. So the Burmese python is a staple in its diet. So it's got those natural develop or natural controls in its native environment. Here in the Everglades, the only apex predator that those uh, species grew up with were the Florida panther and the alligator. So there hasn't been a, a predator like this in the Everglades for thousands and thousands of years. And now all of a sudden there's 18 foot, 215 pound pythons roaming around eating deer, but they are fighting back. Nature is finding a balance. Younger snakes fall prey to, you know, herons, wood storks, raccoons, opossums, even though that all of those species have been found in the belly of a python as well, they are kind of keeping the, the little ones in check. However, in the first year of their life, they can grow up to seven feet. That is by far out of the reach of a lot of those predators. A raccoon, a possum, herons, nothing's gonna be able to take out a seven foot, one year old baby python, except maybe an alligator. Alligators will. But even them, alligators have been found in the stomach contents of python. So it's just going to take time before this invasive species kind of finds that balance. But right now, humans going out and hunting them, 
Car collisions and the occasional lunch for alligators are the only control for these larger snakes. So that's the quick facts on the Burmese python. I hope you learned something new. And if you did, I would really appreciate a thumbs up or a subscribe if you haven't already. And if you ever get a chance, go to Fort Lauderdale Invasive Species Brewing or Oakland Park Funky Buddha and enjoy some of their great beers down in Florida. Go down, hunt some invasive species, help out the Everglades if you can. But until next time, drink local and plant native. There you go. I'd say probably about you. Yeah. Yeah.